So I think we might go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is the CCS Executive Committee of July 12th, 2023. And I will officially call the meeting to order at 10.02 a.m. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Could I get a roll call? Um, well, once Beth figures out who's supposed to be here, she's <laughs> where to point my voice. Please let me know if you cannot hear me. Bertucci? Present. Filter? Present. Gombrowski? Yes. Dorfman? No. Feel it? We, we can't so hear you, moving. Becky. We see your lips moving. We're not hearing you. <laughs> I there we go. There we go. Thank so, you. Okay. <laughs> Rosenthal, Smith. Here. Uh, also present, we have Steve Lichtel from Lutterbach and Amen. And for CCS, we have Rebecca Malinowski, Deborah Wishmeyer, and Beth Stoneford. Okay. Do I have any additions to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda is adopted as presented. Do we have any public comment? Okay, also hearing none, I will move on to executive committee orientation. So Deborah sent an orientation document to all of us with yesterday, the early, okay, yesterday afternoon. I'm trying to pull that up so I can look at that. Um, and what we want to do today is just, um, we gave everybody a chance to go over it. We're not going to go through it line by line. We just want to ask if there are any questions. We do have, as Beth said, uh, Steve Litko from Lauterbach and Amen with us, and he's here to answer any questions we might have about our financial responsibilities. So, um, if anybody has any questions about that, let's start there. Or, Steve, is there anything you want us to know as the executive committee? Um, no, I mean, nothing, nothing that specifically comes to mind. I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions now or in the future that anyone might have, but nothing immediately came to mind as far as, as, far as things to know. Um, and then I would just point out, it's come up very occasionally. Um, What's in your packet is a condensed version of our financials. It's our, our board report. We do have a full version available that we receive from Lauterbach and Amen that Beth and I review monthly. And th those are available at any time to any member of CCS that may have an interest in them. Um, I would I think it's about four years ago, we, ma we like made a bunch of changes to the financial documents. Um, in consultation with Wes and Steve at Lauterbach and Amen. So, um, again, we do have more detailed financials available, but for the purposes of the board, um, we determined this was an acceptable and useful amount of information. Thanks, Rebecca. That's good to know. I know some people, this is not your first year on the CCS board, and obviously all of you deal with financials in uh, your own libraries. So, um, Hearing no questions about that, we will thank Steve for logging in here for a few moments. Um, we'll let you know if anything comes up later, Steve. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for the invite. And yeah, let me know if anything comes up. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, you might have wanted to comment on a few other items on that executive committee orientation. Um, yes, so I just had... Uh, I think two other comments. Um, the first is just around meetings in general. Um, when we write the agendas, we do try to keep business um, front loaded, like our heavier, more in-depth discussion topics or things we need action on. We do try to put at the top of the agenda so we don't as a group run out of steam or if folks have conflicts, um, you know, hopefully we can get through the good stuff first. Um, and then, just a comment on committee responsibilities. Um, one of the bullets is approve expenditures of budgeted items and non-budgeted items as specified in fiscal accountability policy. Um, so approving expenditures for budgeted items, that's just gonna be our bills for payment. 
And then non-budgeted items over $5,000 um, will come as itemized things for the committee to discuss and approve um, as we have later on our agenda today, which again, I think is very similar to most of your libraries, although I know those spending limits do vary from organization to organization. And that's what I have, and I'm happy to answer any other questions if there are any. Um, I just had a question, Rebecca. Um, where where is a, a copy of the fiscal accountability policy available? Um, yes. So on the last page of that document, we link to the full policies doc. Um, it's in there. It's kind of a beast of a document, but fiscal accountability is linked from the table of contents. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, Monica. Anybody else? Okay. And then we will move on to the consent agenda, which includes that list of things that you see on your agenda. Uh, minutes from May 10th, monthly financial statements from May 2023, uh, bills for payment for May 2023, monthly financial statements from June, and bills for payment for June. Uh, can I get a motion to approve all of those items? So moved, Heidi Smith. Second. Dombrowski seconds. Thank you both. Did you get those, Beth? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Then could I get a roll call on those? Bertucci? Yes. Dilger? Yes. Dombrowski? Yes. Felix? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Okay, now we move on to the meat of the agenda, the business. So we have some innovative updates in your packet, starting on page 19. Um, and I believe Deborah is going to update us first on system performance progress. Sure thing. Um, so we had a handful of system performance issues in May and June that were summarized in your packet. Um, the only issue at this time that is still unresolved is slowness in the mark import queue. Um, which is impacting your cataloging and acquisition staff. Um, so essentially what's happening is that the job that looks for new mark import files to pick up is just getting stuck after it loads a file. Um, so it's not restarting like it should. So as of last Friday, Innovative has been like manually monitoring those jobs and make sure, making sure they're restarting if they get stuck. Um, and they are working with their development team for a permanent resolution. Um, and so we're waiting for an update on that. But hopefully we should hear from Innovative um, sometime this week on that. Um, and sorry, Deborah, with the manual work that they're doing, the impact to catalogers right now is minimal. Yes. Okay. So over the last three days, we haven't seen any issues with the import queue. Um, so things are chugging along as they should be. Um, we know it's been really frustrating for your cataloging staff over the past couple of weeks as they're dealing with this, but um, what Innovative is doing manually seems to have temporarily fixed the problem, though again, we're waiting on a like permanent resolution. Um, which again, hopefully we should hear back from Innovative sometime this week and be able to share that out in CCS News. Um, Again, the, I think the other issues in the packet are resolved at this point in time. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Any questions about any of those system performance issues? No, okay, great. Uh, so Deborah, tell us about the alternative text messaging service. Oh, text messages, I would love to talk about it. Um, so as we know, we had some issues with Blair's text message delivery over the last several months. Um, and this has been caused by Innovative's use of an outdated way to send text message, which is for email to text delivery method. Um, it's no longer being accepted by certain vendors like T-Mobile and Verizon. So about a month ago, CCS began investigating alternate text message services. Um, and after that research, we recommend that we move forward with contracting with Message B for text message notices. So Rebecca did successfully negotiate a $7,000 credit from Innovative to help us offset um, the cost of moving forward with a third party service. Um, and the cost of that would be between nine and $10,000. 
depending on if we move forward with a one or three year contract with message fee. So today we're looking for um, a vote to authorize that spend. Rebecca, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, we haven't received the contract documents for one or three years yet. Um, I just wanna see what the penalties would be for early cancellation on a three year before we decide. Um, but the 10,000 that Deborah mentioned would be a max. I think it's actually 9,900 and $95, uh, so. Um, and Innovative does have, have plans to update their text messaging technology. However, our site, our account rep did say that there would be, we would incur an additional fee um, for adopting that service. So they weren't able to give us um, a concrete timeline on when that would happen, though sometime in the next year. So I asked earlier about the budgetary implications of this and Rebecca explained that, you know, so we'll get a $7,000 credit in the line where Innovative is charged. Um, we'll have an additional 10,000 in a software line that has some room in it anyway, if, if I'm, yes. So, uh, so we'll see differences in those lines, but overall the budget, we won't necessarily go over budget for this. Does anybody have any questions about it? Do any other, oh, I just, do any other consortiums use this service? Do any other library systems use message B? Yeah, um, two of our neighbors do. So both Swan and Pinnacle just moved to message B earlier this year um, and had good things to say about the service. Awesome. Yeah, that's good to know. I had heard of some yeah. using Shout Bomb, but I didn't wasn't familiar with Message B, so that's good to know. I mean, I feel like this is a service we we need to continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't yeah. think our, our patrons want us to just discontinue text messaging or to have it work intermittently. Yeah. Um, do we know about what it, kind of implementation timeline once we sign? Um, uh, Rob, the Message B rep said it would be really fast. I think he said it turnaround time could be like one. A month, one to two months. Is that yeah, right? and um, Matt Hammermeister over at Pinnacle, he specifically spoke about implementation and said, like, I believe his exact words were, "It's so nice to work with a vendor that's competent." Um, he said the <laughs> <was> really smooth. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, we do think it, it would be a few weeks to a, um, maybe like three to six weeks for for rollout. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if there are no other questions, could I get a motion? The um, potential action is listed on page 20 of your packet. I'll make that motion um, to authorize CCS to implement message B at a cost not to exceed $10,000 for year one. Second was Becky. Oh, no, sorry. Joanna. That was Joanna with Becky seconding. Okay. Roll call vote. Bertucci? Yes. Filter? Yes. Dombrowski? Automatically muted. Yes. Felix? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Okay. Go forth. <laughs> We're doing it. <laughs> we expect results in one month. <laughs> Noted. We'll give you a little more time on that. Okay, uh, the next item is 7A3, patron purge criteria. Rebecca, can you talk us through this one? Yes. Um, I'm a little bummed that we don't have Lindsay on the call today um, since this is an issue that has come up through Glenview um, and she may be able to provide some additional context, but we'll go with what I know. So um, CCS has been using um, CCS has a policy, a patron database maintenance policy, and we use the criteria listed in your packet on page 23, which are written into the policy, um, that patrons who are inactive for three years um, have less than $15 of fines, aren't in collections, and don't currently have an item on their account, um, that those patrons will be purged monthly. Um, and the process is that um, a report is run monthly um, 
those are available in web reports. So library staff have access to review those patrons um, before they are purged. And then um, the, the purge itself is actually a manual process. Like the, the records are all gathered together into one section, but they have to be deleted um, manually in small chunks um, for system performance and just functionality reasons. Um, and so that is work that CCS staff do. Um, the issue is that Glenview is encounter, has encountered patrons whose only activity during a three-year period was renewing their library card. And the act of renewing your library card doesn't update your card's activity. So they had issues where, and there's a couple examples in your packet, a patron hasn't used their card for, you know, two and a half years. They come in, renew their card, don't do anything with their card, and then are purged, you know, six months later. And the timeline varies on when they're seeing this happen. Um, I will say when we initially implemented the patron purge criteria five years ago, we had some questions about it, but it's not a thing that's come up with any regularity. Um, and this is the first time that any specific patron complaints have escalated up to CCS. Glenview is reporting that they get several complaints. Um, so they have asked that we change the criteria because it is policy doing so does need to come to executive committee. Um, change, we can't change the criteria for everybody. We can't just say, okay, let's add expiration date in because we have um, 11 libraries that have either non-expiring cards or a really long expiration period. So essentially their patrons would never be purged. Um, libraries that work with the National Change of Address database, for example, um, some of them update patron expiration dates when those addresses are confirmed. So like, even though they have expiration dates, they keep kind of bumping out. Um, so in general, CCS, we're like, oh, we want we want things to be standardized. As far as support goes, you know, moving to non-standard criteria would make support a little bit more challenging for CCS, but I would say that's not like the blocker here. What it comes down to for CCS is how much value, if any, are members getting from using the same criteria. So Monica, I know that Winneka had, um, there were some changes in what was updating patron last activity for your patrons and a bunch of patrons got purged at once. And um, your, your, um, your manager, I think, requested comp data, essentially. They wanted to know like, okay, what percentage of our patrons are active versus other libraries? And that was data we could provide and with some certainty say like everybody's using the same criteria all the same things update last activity date like here's the data and didn't need like an essay behind it um but again that's that's not a thing that comes up a lot so um you know we can change the criteria to allow libraries to opt in to use the expiration date. It makes the criteria a little bit more complicated, introduces some opportunity for error, but would resolve the patron, potentially the patron complaints with Glenview while maintaining the service for the libraries that don't want to offer or that don't want to expire their cards. Um, internally, we've discussed some other options as well for how to address this issue if we don't want to change that policy. And by we, I mean the committee. Um, and those are in your packet. I'd say like none of them are a slam dunk. <laughs> um, one thing I will note is um, the third bullet on page 24, encourage libraries to send pre-purge notifications to patrons. So um, Niles Main is doing this. Um, you can get the list of patrons that are gonna be purged the next month um, from web reports. And so they're sending them some sort of email notice, phone call, postcard. I'm not entirely sure how they're communicating with them um, to say like, 
hey, if you don't use your card, it's going to go away. And um, patrons can do a simple task at home, like logging into Power. Like all they have to do is log into Power Pack with their library card number and their PIN. They don't have to place a hold. They don't have to check anything out. That updates their last activity and they're removed from eligibility to purge. Um, but that requires both library staff time and patron action to, to be successful. Um, so again, like what we're looking for from executive committee is either an action saying, go update that policy and allow, paid, allow libraries to opt in to use expiration date or guidance saying, we're not ready to update that policy. We want some additional information on one of these other options, work something else out with Glenview or something else. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible for us to, to make the system count a card renewal as an activity? Um, not natively. So Polaris doesn't distinguish between any staff modification to the library card account. So whether it's renewing the library card or like, you know, changing the spelling of someone's last name, those are logged as just like a staff modification to the patron's registration and they don't update last activity date. We can't make it update last activity date non-natively so with a weird workaround we could um if a if a patron were to renew their library card using an external service that connected via api that would update the patron's account so if like communico had a card re like renew my card button that would renew the account so theoretically you know, Bob could build a web interface that like a library, instead of logging into Leap, would like log into this other web interface to renew the card. And then that would update the last activity date because that would use API. Um, so it's like, we can make it do it, but the software won't do it itself, if that makes sense. Got it. Yeah, because one of the issues um, for me is that we have we have card requirements for things other than circulation. And we have a group of people like, for example, who will take a studio class and will never check out an item here. Mm -hmm. So um, so if they get purged, then we've had some problems with that in the past. Um, what do you mean I, my card's not active? So, um, and, and in the spirit of, um, of finding new ways to measure library usage through other types of data points, I would, I would love for us to find some, some way to make this happen because I, I definitely kind of agree with Lindsay on where she's going on her thought process because of situations at my library as well. Sorry, Joanne, I didn't mean to cut oh, you off. No, no, that's okay. Um, if I may, and then I'll, I will go to Joanna, but in, in response to what Monica said on page 25, it's a list of different types of transactions that should update the last activity date. Um, I know, Rebecca, you said like sometimes meeting room reservations, anything that's like checking the card via SIP. So would signing up for a class update the last activity date? It depends on how the library manages the sign up. So look at Glenview, for example, they have two different kinds of room reservations. Um, one is like an Evanster or Communico and that updates the last activity date. But then they also have like, I don't know if it's Calendly or booking, like it's some other booking software um, that you don't put in your library card number. It's not authenticating against the database. So that, and I think those are their like studio reservations. So like a study room reservation does update, but the studio doesn't. And so it depends library to library how they're managing that process. Joanna. Um, my question, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, brand new to the committee, but is, would um, Glenview's problem be solved if they did the national change of address? Would that help them? I think Glenview does do the national do. change of address. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. they do. Um, that does not update the patron's last activity date. Okay. 
But what I understand you to be saying, Rebecca, is one th one way that they could solve it would be to send pre-purge notifications, like email those patrons and say, hey, you know, log into PowerPack if you don't want your card to be removed, right? Yes, they're not automated system notifications, though. We can't. Mm -hmm. um, it would be like an external, like, mail, either postal mail or email thing that they'd have to do. So I guess one thing, one criteria I always have is, you know, how much work are we asking the CCS staff to do for how many patrons or how many libraries? So it, it does sound like, Monica, you're having some issues with this as well. Are other people having issues with this? I see Becky's shaking her head no. I know of. I, it hasn't I know. come up. Usually we check things like that pretty frequently, but we also have a shorter registration period. So I think we're updating addresses more frequently and getting in there. I mean, not, we just said patron activities, what counts, but I don't know that we're having an issue with it. Yeah, if, if we're having issues, it certainly hasn't filtered up to the director level. I, you know, nothing I've heard. I see Heidi kind of nodding along with that too. Um, so other questions? before we talk about a next course of action. I have a question for Monica, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Monica, you said, um, and I don't remember your exact phrasing, you said you wanna see something. You're like, I'd like to make that happen. Was that <laughs> yeah. changing yeah. how the card renewal process worked? Like, I wasn't sure what that was that you wanted yeah, to see. Yeah, that was very vague, wasn't it? I'm a yeah. master <laughs> at that when I'm tired, I apologize. Um, okay. um, well, you know, I, I was I was reading through this, and if we couldn't make the card renewal count as a last activity date, which would be my number one option for a solution, then I like the API renewal tool um, as an alternative. Um, you know, and 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 just speaking for my library again, I know that I'm in a situation that might be different from everyone, um, but there's large portions of my community that will go on holiday for like a month at a time to Europe and, you know, Maine and places like that. And so even if we sent these expiration notices, that still wouldn't necessarily solve my problem because people might not be here and around and available to jump on that and, and get it done. So I'm in favor of, um, I guess, building an API renewal tool <laughs> is, is, I guess, what I would, what I would advocate for. Thank you for asking me to clarify that, Rebecca. Sure. What about the rest of you? I think that makes a lot of sense. D ditto, Monica. <laughs> I guess I'm I'm a little concerned not just about Bob's time to develop that, but the fact that I now have to tell my staff that every time you want to renew a card, you have to do this extra thing outside of Polaris. If I'm understanding right, you'd go to some other, you'd go to a web page to renew a card. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like a lot of extra work for maybe a few patrons that might have to get reissued another card um I don't know what other people think there I mean we, we haven't like sketched out what everything would look like um but I I would imagine I mean I they would type the card number in, or like scan the card number into a website it would maybe pull back some information from Leap so they don't have to like look up the card and Leap and then look up the card again on this other site. And then they'd press the renew button. Um, it would need a login. So it would need to authenticate against the Polaris staff logins database. Um, just for, again, because if it's pulling any patron data back, we need that to be secure. Um, I don't, I don't know how much time it would take for Bob to develop. I do think it would be a good learning opportunity for Bob, but to that end, it's not like something he's going to whip up in, in a day and have available, you know? Um, he, 
I would say in terms of bandwidth, I think there is bandwidth for us to do that. Um, again, is it the most efficient, efficient solution for library staff? Like probably not, but if it's, you know, if adding the expiration date in doesn't actually address when people, right, we can add that to the criteria tomorrow. And then, you know, these patrons at Glenview or whoever else wants to opt in are going to stop getting purged. It doesn't address Monica's point that, you know, we don't know that that, that interaction happened, that that renewal happened. Um, Bob can and has as part of this process um, approximated when cards were renewed. We do these like snapshots of the patron database and look for when the registration changed. Like, you know, he's got some systems in place that we can like see like, okay, this registration was modified on this date. And now the expiration date is three years from that date. Like probably that's when the card was renewed. Um, so we could report that without changing this like last activity date component um, if we're not already, I assume we are in the circ monthly circ. Yeah, so it's a weird issue. It's a weird issue. It, it, it's hard to grapple with. So yeah. if, if Bob developed this API, is this something that libraries could choose? So if my library says, yeah. hey, we're not having this expiration yes. date issue, we just want to renew things the regular way, but then Monica says, I want my staff to do this through this extra mm -hmm. API, they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wouldn't take away the opportunity to renew within LEAP. You'd still renew, you could still renew cards in that same process. It sounds like there's not like a slam dunk amongst the committee of like what our next step should be. I, I'm feeling like we need more people to, more libraries to weigh in. Joanna? I was going to say, is it worth just putting out like a survey or something to see, you know, who's having these issues? Because, you know, I'm in the same boat as Jeannie. Like if there is an issue with this, um, you know, we have a same, same population. We have a makerspace. We have a media lab. There's probably people who are just using those services. Um, so is it worth just putting out a poll or something to see like who's experiencing these issues? And then, you know, going back to say, is this something that we work with those two or three libraries? Um, on a solution versus the whole, you know, the API tool, which may, many of us may not, may not need. Um, just, just a thought. Yeah, why don't, um, why don't we ask Mieko to check in with the CERT group um, as a starting point, and we can maybe get some info from CERC before governing board. And so that way, if we need to like confirm things at governing, like next month is governing board, we'll have all the libraries with us. Um, I can talk with Bob a little bit more about time estimates on like what it would take to make a tool. Um, Cause that, right, if he's like, oh, it actually would be one afternoon and then I'd be done. like or it would be three weeks of work time. That would be, it sounds like helpful context. Um, and then um, I think Lindsay's out for like a solid week maybe based on her out of office, but I'll follow up with her when she's back in um, just to say like, we've talked about it and the committee didn't have a strong push to like, let's get this done. So. Or to solve the problem in a specific way. Yes, I yes, think, yes, yes. I think the committee yeah. recognizes that some libraries are having a problem. Mm -hmm. We're not sure on what is the solution we'd like to, to go with. Okay. And to that end, I'd like for us to talk for a moment about the policy change that's suggested at the bottom of page 24, because I don't think we really did. The other option would be that libraries could opt in to look at expiration date with, during the purge. Um, so those libraries that are having this issue would just say to CCS, please also include expiration as part of the criteria. Mm -hmm. as, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, that would mean we're, we're purging on different criteria. And I don't, I'd, I'd like to get a sense from the committee of how important is it to us that we're using the same criteria across the board for comparison's sake? 
if we don't care about that, maybe that's a, an easier solution than building an API or sending out purge notifications. I guess the only thing I would say to that is I think there is a lot of ambiguity in library data already. Um, you know, look, comparing IFLAR reports, like we know, you know, we're not getting apples to apples comparisons, you know, already. And I think if, you know, if we make a change and it's, it's dramatic and, you know, why are my card hold, if we're purging at three years and my card holder number, which unfortunately is declining um you know and and palatine's goes to six years and now your number is in you know what's palatine doing that park ridge isn't um so i feel like for comparison sake we're already a little in a deficiency just with how iplar is and our fiscal years don't align and the pandemic um so i'm I just this is just top of you know just coming right off the top of my head but i i would i would lean more towards consistency just because so many of our boards like data um, and to have comparisons be as you know accurate as possible, we know they'll never be perfect. Um, just my thoughts. I think it's fine if we're, I mean, because it's, it's an opt-in, we're modifying a policy to say you can opt in if you want. So I don't, I mean, I like having that written somewhere um, so that new members could orient or we have things to refer to, to Joanna's point. So I think I heard Joanna, because at first I thought you were saying because data isn't consistent anyway, you were okay oh. with it being inconsistent, but then gotcha. at the end you sort of fooled me and, and you said you would like to keep it consistent as much as possible, right? Yes, but not I I hadn't looked at it from what you just said <laughs> that it's already <laughs> inconsistent. So I mean, yeah, that argument could go both both ways. Um so I am more, you know, I I feel like consistency is a good thing, but as you just said, if you know if the data is not great already, um, you know, does it really matter? So I I could now I could now I'm now I've confused myself. I could go either way, I guess. Um this is not a straightforward issue. Yeah. Beck or Heidi, any thoughts about consistent data? I mean, Joanna makes a great point that the data is already wildly inconsistent and that our boards love to compare us to each other and then be like, what is this one doing that you're not doing? And, yeah. you know, it's not apples to apples. So it would be nice to keep the data consistent. However, you know, it's already even with that, it's going to still be inconsistent data. Right. So. I don't have a strong feeling on it one way or the other. The opt-in sounds like a good option, especially if it really isn't affecting that many libraries. However, I like the option to especially talk to the CERC group because just because I don't think this is an issue doesn't mean it's not something that's happening regularly at the CERC desk and they just haven't come to me yet to say, hey, this is a thing we're experiencing. You know, I right. want to talk to my head of CERC and just ask her because it's very likely she's going to tell me, oh yeah, that's a giant pain in the neck and we deal with it all the time. And I just hadn't told you yet because we were just dealing with it. Yeah, usually totally she tells me, but yeah. I'm with I'm with you there. So so if the first step is to ask um, our experts and get their way in, I feel like the the next step would be to hear from the CCS team. Like, okay, it's this many people. We would really rather have like an across the board type solution that we can get to and give to anybody who develops this problem or any new member. Or you could say, we don't think it's worth it um, to have a, an across the board solution for this many, many people. And I think I think part of that will come down to you, like um, what's the most efficient way to solve it if it's for six libraries, for two libraries, for 20 libraries. Okay, does that give you guys some direction? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, we did not answer it for you right away. It's fine. It's it's a weird thing when I when they the issue was first brought to me, I was like, "What do you mean it doesn't it doesn't update when you renew the card?" <laughs> so I I'm in the same boat. It took me a while to understand what the issue was because it just seems so counterintuitive. Um, so, and and for me, it was like 
why do people come in and renew their card and then do nothing with it? That was also the thing that's confusing to me. I'm like, well, I'm in and look at this thing on the display and I might as well take it. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, Lindsay does seem very, con, not confused, but she's like, she just seemed like flabbergasted that she's like, nobody else complains about this. Like, this is such a weird thing. It happens all the time. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So, okay. Okay. Great. All right. We'll do some more digging. Thank you. Um, okay, so that leads to page 26, manual item recovery. I think Deborah's just going to give us some info on that. Yes, I will give a rundown because this is a little bit of a confusing thing to wrap your brain around. Um, so currently in Polaris, when a patron has an item that's overdue for 45 days, the system will automatically flip that item to lost and the patron will be sent a billing notice for the material. We have a few libraries who, in addition to that billing notice, are sending like a manual letter or email to patrons to encourage them to return their lost items to the library to have the fees waived off their account. Um, so this sort of like manual process of contacting patrons has led to just some confusion amongst our libraries because the few libraries that are doing it um, have been doing it in different ways. And so it's confused some patrons, it's confused some staff at other libraries. Um, and so we're looking for some guidance from this group on should we have standards for when a library is like allowed to contact a patron about lost materials outside of like the standard Polaris billing notice. Um, so we have, Again, I think three libraries who are sending this, what we're calling manual item recovery letter or notice to patrons. Um, we have a library who's contacting all the patrons who checked out materials at their library. So if a patron, let's say, checked out at Palatine, loses an item, Palatine then kind of sends a letter to them to say, hey, bring your stuff back to the library. Um, that we can waive your fees. We have another library who is contacting their patrons um, about items that they've lost. And we did have another library who was contacting patrons who checked out their items and lost their library's items. So it's like kind of everyone doing a little bit something different, um, which led to some confusing pa patron interactions who were like, hey, this library contacted me to bring this back to you. But then the library's like, well, no, that wasn't us. That was this library. You got to go to that library to give them back the thing. So it just led to a lot of confusion. Um, so any questions kind of on the process or what some of these libraries are doing? I can answer it as best as I can. And and do I understand that the libraries that are doing this often are do not have unique or some sort of recovery service and that's why they're doing it? Or? I think that's correct. Yes. I. I there's one exception, I think, to that, um, but the library is not actively submitting patrons now. So yes, it's sort of like a unique management alternate service where the library staff are contacting the patrons instead of unique. Instead of paying unique. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That was a good one. So again, CCS has kind of fielded several questions on like, hey, this library is doing this thing. Are they allowed to? Are we allowed to do this? Um, who can we contact? Who should we not contact? So we brought this to the CERC ILL advisory group and they talked about it in June. Um, and they thought that it would be really helpful to have guidelines. So like we're all being consistent, you know, patrons aren't being contacted potentially by like two different libraries, depending on what they're doing. Um, and they thought that the best practice would be to contact patrons who checked out at your library. So like you could only send this sort of extra contact to the patron if they check the item out at your location. Um, so we're bringing this to you to see like, is this something worth pursuing? Should we put together guidelines that we'd require libraries to follow if, again, if they were to move forward or we're interested in sending sending this additional contact, we are not interested, I will emphasize, in requiring anyone or even recommending that anyone spend staff time doing this. Um, but for those libraries that want to, should we set guidelines? 
I'll, I'll start. Like I'll say I think guidelines would be great. Um, it would kind of be nice if they match. Like when I send something to Unique, it's based on my patrons, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like it should be. It should match what I'm doing as a Unique user. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the rest of you think. It should be about my patrons, not about that where the item was checked out or who owns the item. All right, I got completely lost in that because it sounds like they're doing different things. Like each of the libraries yeah. that are reaching out are yeah. doing some. Really different. You did not get lost. Oh, okay. Exactly <laughs> what is happening? I'm like trying to follow my choo choo. Definitely went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to process. Yeah. That's why we were thinking guidelines. Yeah. Of who right, you can sure. contact. Yeah. Well, because when you said something like, like if someone had checked something out at Palatine and then Palatine's calling my patron and saying, you have to go to Palatine to check or to return it. That's where I got lost was the, was, whose library are we returning something to or did they check it out at Crystal Lake and now they have to go to somewhere else to return. Yeah, that's where I got Which confused. also is not even true. They can return it anywhere. Right, exactly, that's where I got lost. I was like, couldn't they still so, yeah, just bring it where they, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Do you see Joanna? Yeah, oh, sorry, Joanna, thank you. Sorry. Um, I came from a Swan library and I don't know if it was a policy or just best practice. You, we only contacted our patrons. Um, if we had an issue with like an item on our list that was, you know, long overdue, the CERC manager or someone would reach out to that library, you know, and say, hey, can you nudge this person along or if there was an issue, but we never contacted other libraries patrons. Um, I just think that's you know, gets it gets muddy because then again, it's like, who are you? Where where are you calling me from? You know, if we should stay with their their home library, just be my opinion. I agree, and maybe that they did nice. check it out at that other location. Yeah, I agree because it's your patron. I mean, you're the one that's going to have to deal with that. You know, deal with them if there's fallout or or whatever. Um, you're their home. You know, you're the one. We're the ones that are issuing them the cards. We you know control their account. I think it that should stay with the the home library. Yeah, I agree with Jeannie. I have concerns about the initial recommendation that they don't match the unique practice, which is sort of like hard coded. We can't really go and and change that. So, I did want to get some feedback from executive committee as we have just gotten um because I think we will need to like rediscuss it with them and kind of like do some massaging, like finessing to, to get things lined up correctly. And I didn't want, you know, again, to waste folks time. If that executive committee was like, who cares? Let them do whatever they want, which I didn't think would be the outcome. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think the, just to speak to the, maybe what the circuit ILL advisor group, why they recommended that is because like that library has already had contact with the patron, right? That's the library that sent the patron the checkout library, mm -hmm. the transacting library, is the library that would have sent the billing notice to the patron, was presum presumably the library that the patron was physically at to check out the material. Um, so I think that's why they recommended kind of what they did. Um, and then to throw in like another library, mm -hmm. I think was like, could be potentially confusing, but to speak to what Jeannie and Rebecca said, that is how Unique already works. And we do have several libraries that are doing that already. Um, and it might be helpful to be consistent. And I do think it's, you know, um, going back to, to the example, I'll, I'll give another example. So like if, if a pa Palatine patron requests something on hold from Crystal Lake, they don't necessarily know that it came from Crystal Lake. They don't pay attention right. to what it says on the barcode, right? So then to have Crystal Lake contact them, I think could be confusing. Yeah, and that is what one library was doing and what was confusing um, for then the, the item or the library, the patron's library. Um, item patron is yeah. very confusing. <laughs> right, because then presumably the patron's going to call their library and say, hey, this other library is calling me about this item that, yeah. Right. That's super complicated. I really like uh, what Joanna said about just where, Take care of, contact your own patrons. Worry about your own patrons. Yeah. Okay. I but but we're generally agreeing the guidelines are good. Yeah. <laughs> and it should be based around the patrons. It's home library. 
Okay. We will work on that. Great. It seems okay. like we could contact each other if there was a big issue, you know. Right, right. If you really wanted an item back, call yeah. the the library and ask them to reach out to their patron or something. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's an option as part of the guidelines. We'll dig in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So looking at our time, um, Rebecca gave a report on page 28 about new and potential members. Any questions about those? I would just note it looks like the Waukegan vote will be in August, not in July, but still looking positive. Okay. Great. Um, and would they then join at the same time as Mount Prospects? Is that the goal? Yes, to be on that same timeline. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And then on page 29, we have a report about the office move. We are all, if in case you haven't figured it out, all in the same room in the new office. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, any questions about that? We are finishing up paying the bills from the old location and getting new bills from new <laughs> a little confusing. New um, electricity, but uh, it's all going to be smoothed out here in a couple months. So, okay. So we will move on to reports. Uh, for the president's report, I would first like to, because I don't think we did this before, thank Heidi Smith for her year as president. Um, okay. And so. Um, we want to talk about what's on the agenda at the August Governing Board meeting. Rebecca, I think you had a few things on that. Yes. So page 30 of your packet has a super brief um, piece of information um, based on the Long Range Planning Committee's recommendations for projects for next year. So those will go to Governing Board in August. Um, one of those relates to considering Find More Illinois membership. And so Deborah will give um, a brief introduction into the research she's already done about that and then what remains to be answered to help governing board make a decision about if that's a good idea for us or not. Um, we're also gonna be working on moving to ACH payments. Um, so we may or may not have some requests just to review at governing board for sending and receiving ACH from you, like from all of you for payments and rebates and things like that, but we may may not have that ready yet. Um, and it sounds like possibly patron purge criteria yeah. may end up on the agenda. Yes. Is there anything else you would like to see on the August governing board agenda? Okay. Um, also, uh, that got sent out separately, it's not in the packet, is the appointments that I am making for governance committees. I am making, Rebecca wrote this. <laughs> but as president, I will officially appoint the names that you see there for the governance committees. And then that moves us. That is all that I have for my president's report. Do we have anything from the secretary? Our secretary and treasurer are both out today. <laughs> okay. Skipping both of those. Who are the who are those people? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, Lindsay Dorfman is our secretary okay. and um, Lauren Rosenthal is our treasurer. Um, so Jeannie, we'll probably ask you to approve the minutes once Beth completes them for this meeting since okay. neither of them can do it. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, and then on page 36 and 37 of your packet, we have committee and group reports. Did anybody have any questions about those? Okay, hearing none, let's move on to the executive director's report. Rebecca. My report is in the packet. I'm happy to take questions um, on anything in there or anything CCS related that's not in there. I confess that I just got back from a two week vacation, so I haven't read it closely. I'm relying all on all of you to tell me <laughs> if there's anything in there that you have questions about. 
give everybody a, a, another minute to quickly glance through that. I feel like we had some really meaty stuff for this first meeting of the year. So thank you for your feedback on, on those items. Yes. Okay. I think then that we will, unless anybody has any other issues, I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 10.56 a.m. Thank you all for your time this morning. Everyone have a good day.